Chapter 14 of The Romance of the Ship. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Romance of the Ship by Edward Keeble Chatterton. Chapter 14 The Modern Man of War. From the type of battleship represented by the Majestic, Magnificent, and their sisters, this class developed during the next years following into a battleship that was fairly light, had a moderate speed, and was armed always with four 12-inch guns, in addition to those of smaller account. Interesting as the study is to all lovers of ships, we have not the space to deal individually with the succeeding classes of battleships which followed. The Majestics had been followed by the Canopus class, which were in tonnage somewhat smaller but in speed were one knot faster then came the formidables slightly bigger than the majestics but of the same speed eighteen knots as those bracketed with the canopus battleships the duncan class of nineteen o one with a tonnage of fourteen thousand and a speed of nineteen knots the king edward seven class instituted two years later with the same speed but a tonnage of sixteen thousand three hundred and fifty and the lord nelson's of nineteen o six differed but little in either tonnage or speed these all prepared the way for the coming of that new type of ship which has revolutionized the navies of all the world and has hastened the rapidity of obsolescence beyond any rate previously contemplated it is then with the advent of the dreadnought one of the most wonderful products of the twentieth century that the arts of naval warfare have been brought to a pitch of unparalleled terror in the perfection of their death-dealing powers for the first time in the history of the sea was observed a great steel monster of nearly eighteen thousand tons heavily armored and heavily armed costing a couple of million pounds with the extraordinary speed for a floating fort of twenty-one knots in her we saw the wonderful stage to which the turret ship principle combined with a multitude of other and more modern ideas had developed the main characteristic of the dreadnought and her successors lies in the thorough-going adaptation of the all big gun theory in any naval war the issue it is supposed now will be decided by the amount of havoc which the guns will work upon the enemy torpedoes and mines deadly enough though they be are accidents rather than essentials of the modern sea fight we have seen the trend of the warship since the introduction of armor and improved guns and have observed that the last few decades have been one continuous competition between these two contrary entities the ram came in and went out again the torpedo which at first was thought to be able to make the existence of the big ship unendurable is not the important factor that it once was and for the following reason as the power of the gun increased so did its range consequently in the next great naval war the opposing battleships will open hostilities when they are several miles apart now the torpedo though an engine of destruction at relatively close quarters cannot travel beyond a certain distance and thus its own limitations and the extended range of the gun have caused naval development to concentrate in one particular sphere thus whereas before the appearance of the dreadnought the heaviest armament of the battleship from the majestics of eighteen ninety four to the lord nelson of nineteen o six had consisted of four of these twelve inch guns which we dealt with at an earlier stage now that new type of ship sets the fashion of being supplied with ten instead of a quartet of these weapons in addition of course to her twenty-seven small quick firers the coming of the dreadnought has given the standard to all other naval powers of the civilized world so that in studying her we are gaining some little insight into the latest type which every nation is copying the twelve-inch gun too after no end of discussion and changes has become recognized as the standard to go by for as we just saw now the old one hundred and ten ton gun was found too heavy while the twelve inch though anything but light can be carried well and fired with exceedingly penetrative effect it will be readily understood that it is not merely the gun which adds up weight but its ammunition and its mountings too 
It is indeed difficult to estimate the importance of the gun too highly, and for that reason the whole subject of naval design is based on the principle of rendering the greatest service to these weapons. In Nelson's and earlier times, the battleship was a ship first and a weapon afterwards, but today she is intended for battle on sea, and everything else is subservient to this purpose. In spite of the important tasks which belong to the cruisers, the torpedo craft, and so on, it is the battleship which really counts, and on her must fall the brunt of the conflict. Unless, therefore, her guns are of such power and her gunners are of such skill that her fire is a fair match for the enemy, little else matters. Strategy and tactics, theories and organizations, avail but little when the main essential is wanting so that when hostilities begin there is in the naval mind that one guiding principle of hitting first, hitting hard, and keeping on hitting as long as there is an enemy to hit. Now, hitting has become not merely a remarkably intricate art, but a highly expensive one. Every time the modern 12-inch gun is fired, it means a cost of 100 pounds. Even at a distance of 13 miles away, its projectile will penetrate 8 inches of armor. On the other hand, the dreadnought battleships, to be protected against the enemy's fire, have a belt of Krupp steel 11 inches thick, this being equal to 20 inches of the old-fashioned compound armor which we have discussed some time earlier in our story. The Citadel theory, which we also explained, is still well exemplified in the case of the dreadnought. The midship section of the dreadnought is protected with Krupp steel about 11 inches thick. To enter here into a discussion of the gunner's art is altogether foreign to our subject, but, as illustrating the development of the ship of war, it will not be out of place to give the reader some idea of the way in which firing from a modern battleship will be carried on in the next sea fight. When aiming at the object to be hit, there are various matters to be taken into consideration. Owing, of course, to the laws of gravitation, the gun must be aimed higher than the target to be hit. Then allowance must be duly made for the conditions of the air, the rate and direction of the wind, but these may vary very much over the space the projectile has to pass before it reaches its target. Thus, supposing the firing is within the range of 15 miles, the projectile will rise to the terrific height of over 22,000 feet in the air, the height of a very lofty mountain, before it comes down into the hull of the enemy. Then there is another allowance to be made when the ship firing is under way and steaming anything up to twenty knots or more, for the enemy's vessel will have changed her relative position during the few seconds elapsed since the projectile left the gun, and though this may be only a hundred yards or so, it is quite enough to make a miss, and the hundred-pound shot has been expended with no good result. But nowadays, naval gunnery has improved to such a state of perfection that after the first shot it is expected to get near but not hit. The gun is directed to the right or left, lower or higher, according as the first shot has fallen short. Two men are busy at each gun, each looking through a telescope, and each with a wheel for controlling the direction of the gun horizontally and vertically. On shore, when the fort is unmoving, the ability to fire well necessitates the greatest skill, but what shall we say when the fort is a steel ship, which, in spite of her enormous displacement, is never steady for one moment, and in bad weather makes good gunnery one of the hardest tasks that could be wished for? And yet, as affording some idea to the wonderful skill which is possessed by the gunners of the British Navy, we may mention, not inappropriately, that recently, when firing at a target very considerably smaller than the size of a battleship, at a distance of 8,000 yards or 4.5 miles, of the six shots fired, four went right through, and the other two also ricocheted through. When next the reader finds himself looking at the dreadnought, he will notice a kind of platform perched high up on the mast where its three legs converge. Here is what is known as the fire control station whence the ship is, as regards her firing at least, directed through the battle. When opening hostilities the range is found from this platform and signaled down to the men behind the gun. We need not endeavor to realize the serious position of the fire control station, which is, in fact, not merely the brain but the eyes of the ship. 
At a range of several miles, it would not be easy to hit this tempting mark, but it is far more probable that damage would be done to its supports, and in order to diminish the fatal result of such an accident, it will be noticed that it is customary now to have the tripod mast, so that if one leg is shot away, the other two may support their burden. Turning our attention now from the battleship to the cruiser, we find the measure of her importance becoming greater and greater until she has, in the case of the Invincible class, become a much more powerful unit than most of the battleships which preceded the Dreadnought. Whereas, as we saw just now, these earlier fighting ships carried nothing heavier than four 12-inch guns, yet the Indomitable, Invincible, and her sisters, though they are cruisers, carry no fewer than eight 12-inch weapons of this kind. The evolution of the first-class cruiser from the time of the Powerful and Terrible when they were protected but not armored, is full of interest. The Cressy class, which passed into the navy at the beginning of the new century, were vessels of 12,000 tons with a speed of 21.5 knots, costing 750,000 pounds, whilst the Invincible cost most of a million pounds more. The heaviest armament of the Cressy consisted of a couple of 9.2-inch guns, a kind of weapon which has attained great popularity in the British navy and is found on both battleships and cruisers. Inferior in regard to smashing power as compared with the 12-inch gun, it can be fired more frequently in the minute, and at a range of 3,000 yards will carry its shot through the equivalent of 25 inches of wrought iron. The Cressy type of cruiser was succeeded by the County class, which, though several thousand tons smaller, were two knots faster their armament being 14 6-inch guns and 13 small quick firers. The Drake, the Good Hope, and King Alfred, and the Leviathan followed next, being four funneled vessels of 14,100 tons and 23.5 knot speed. Armed with two 9.2-inch guns, as well as 33 guns of smaller caliber, they were able to get away from many of the battleships afloat and at the same time to deal them a good deal of damage. After these, in the year 1903, came what are now known as the new county class of armored cruisers, of which the Hampshire is familiar to those who spend any part of their season in the neighborhood of the Isle of Wight. Smaller than the Drake class, with the same turn of speed, they were the forerunners, with the Minotaur and the Duke of Edinburgh class intervening. Of that newest and most wonderful class of all which have recently astonished the world as the finest, the fastest, and the heaviest armed cruisers in existence. To this class belong the Indomitable, the Invincible, and others. When the first mention made her record trip homeward across the North Atlantic, with the present King George aboard after His Majesty's visit to Canada, the vessel attained the marvelous speed of over twenty-nine knots, beating not merely the record of any warship, cruiser, or battleship alike, but even throwing the marvelous performances of the Mauritania and the Lusitania into the shade. For a man of war, with her heavy plated hull and carrying her heavy armament, to have accomplished so wonderful a feat is an achievement which will long be remembered and marks an important stage in the romantic story of the ship. Practically, therefore, the cruiser has evolved from the old sailing frigate to the present state, when she is really nothing less than a powerful battleship but possessing mobility of the very highest order, and in any naval campaign her value would be difficult to reckon too highly. In her, too, the principle of mounting the guns so there is a minimum of the dead sector defect, which we alluded to earlier, has been carried out with admirable success. But battleships and cruisers alone do not compose a nation's navy. Although their place is preeminent, yet there is important work to be carried out by other and smaller units. A class of small, protected, second-class cruisers is now being built, and although their size is less than 5,000 tons, yet their speed is 26 knots. These vessels, following the example set by the crack ships of the mercantile marine, are fitted with turbine engines. Following out the idea of territorial association, they are being named after important cities of the United Kingdom, the five comprising the Bristol, Newcastle, Glasgow, Gloucester, and the Liverpool. With the Newcastle, 
there was at her naming an interesting innovation, for contrary to practice, she was launched with her four funnels, her boilers, condensers, outmost turbines, auxiliary machines, boiler room bulkheads, and protective decks already in place. Only two heavy weights, her main turbines, remaining to be lifted on board. And this operation was performed the following day. This established a record, for hitherto no such thing had been done the custom being to put the engines and so on aboard after the ship had taken the water, so that she may be launched as light as possible. Another unit which forms an interesting special development of the ship is the scout, whose high speed makes up for her lack of fighting qualities, for she would not be able to endure the battering which even a cruiser could administer to her thinly protected hull. Able to run out at sea and gather important information of the strength and movement of the enemy's fleet, and then flash the news back by wireless telegraphy to the flagship, the scouts have a sphere of great usefulness. Twenty-five knots is their speed, and they are armed with sixteen small, quick-firing guns with which to reply to the attack of other fast, small craft which the enemy might send out against them. Their draft is only about fourteen feet so that they are able to negotiate small channels and shallow estuaries. A new class of scout cruisers is being built at the present time, rather bigger than their predecessors, but with the same speed. This is known as the Bodicea class, with a displacement of over 3,000 tons. They are designed as an improvement on the old type, and will replace the latter as parent ships to the torpedo destroyers. They are being fitted with Marconi wireless telegraph gear, we now pass on to that wicked-looking, crafty creature, the Torpedo Destroyer, whose mission in life is to send her instrument of death into the enemy's hull quickly yet cautiously, and then dart away as fast as her powerful engines will take her. Her pedigree is worth recalling. At the present stage of development, she is practically a large torpedo boat with a far larger amount of displacement, better sea-going qualities, a powerful engine equipment, and a high rate of speed. She has become, in fact, very much more than the nature of the torpedo ship that the little, black, tin war canoe of the torpedo boat. But advancing from small size to big, from moderate to enormous speed, the destroyer has become so costly an item in any naval program that it has become a serious question as to whether they are worth the money which their construction diverts from the building of battleships and armored cruisers. Thus the swift the fastest warship in the world, which was recently launched, is one of the modern destroyer type and aptly illustrates her point. Her cost represents an outlay of no less than 280,500, and when the much more powerful unit, a modern dreadnought, can be completed with all her engines, armor, and ample armament for 1,700,450,000, the problem becomes one of some magnitude. It was in the 80s that France and Germany had built up a fairly large class of torpedo boats. We mentioned some time back that one of the fads through which the Navy has passed was the all-importance of the destructive power of the torpedo which the torpedo boat was to fire, and as a sudden realization of this fact, the British Admiralty created the destroyer to be superior to the continental torpedo craft in sea-going qualities, in speed, in size, and in fuel-carrying capacity and to carry small, quick-firing guns in addition to the dangerous torpedoes discharged from her side. Originally only a craft of less than 200 tons displacement, with a top speed of 22 knots, this type of destroyer has continued to develop, until, in the case of the Swift, just mentioned, and her ten sisters, the displacement is between 700 and just below a 1,000 tons, with the remarkable and unheard-of sea speed of 41 miles per hour. An interesting feature is that this class burns not coal, but oil, and can steam at moderate speeds for over 15,000 miles without re-oiling, so that in time of war they can keep the sea independently of the shore for a considerable length of time. The Admiralty as a result of important tests, has made extensive arrangements for purchasing from Scotch companies large supplies of oil fuel, part of the arrangement specifying that the oil shall be stored for delivery as wanted in big storage tanks at certain east coast ports. The oil is obtained in bulk, 
20,000 tons being the equivalent of 5 million gallons. The original destroyers had only one 12-pounder and three 6-pounder guns. But each of the newer tribal-type mounts three 12-pounders, in addition to two tubes for firing 18-inch torpedoes. This Swift is the most remarkable ship in any navy of the world and is fitted with turbines which develop twice as much power as the battleships of the formidable type already noticed. She can travel, in fact, at a rate of 36 knots an hour, which is the equivalent of about 41 and a half land miles, and this wonderful turn of speed would make her, in any naval engagement today, a most dangerous unit for from her four four-inch guns can be fired 15 projectiles of 25 pounds each minute, to say nothing of the torpedoes dispatched from her tubes. But simultaneously, with the improvement in type of ship and armament has gone forward the gunnery of those on board these ships, and a recent admiralty memorandum states that their lordships note with great satisfaction the considerable improvement in the results some of the destroyers having made what are esteemed actually marvellous records, obtaining in one case 15.33 hits out of the 16-pounder per minute, the gun used being the 12-pounder. When the appearance and character of the ship of war are so frequently changing, owing to the restless efforts to obtain perfection and efficiency, it may seem only of passing an ethereal interest that we should discuss the trend of the latest naval types but the present age sees such marvellous advancements made, such comparative equality among naval powers, that it is impossible to have a comprehensive grasp of the modern development of the steam warship, or of its future probable tendencies, without having first gained some insight into the ships that are in being. The dreadnought type, which embodies the principles of the all-big-gun theory, is really the last and most complete extension of that lesson which the little American ship Monitor taught during the preceding century. It is a sufficient proof that the turret system of placing the big guns is a thoroughly sound one. The United States, Japanese, French, German, Italian, Austrian, Brazilian, and Argentinian governments have all followed this mammoth battleship type. Foreign navies have introduced such improvements as carrying a powerful, quick-firing battery, which the British completed vessels of this type lack. The plea put forward on behalf of the smaller and less costly battleship, of that 14,000-ton Duncan type, for instance, which we mentioned above, is not accepted with much enthusiasm among experts. Among other reasons, the smaller class of battleship would be inferior because she cannot be protected to withstand efficiently the fire of the heavily armed ship of war, nor in bad weather would she be able to fight her guns with the ease with which the bigger ship could carry on her work. It is probable that before long those battleships which, in any navy, do not belong to the dreadnought type, will have to be rebuilt in order to come up to that standard for the value of the pre-dreadnought ships is diminishing more rapidly than a previous type is usually placed out of fashion. One of the dominant principles of naval strategy is that fleets and squadrons should be composed of ships of similar speed, gunpower, coal endurance, range of fire, and armor plating resistance. For the strength of a chain, as the old proverb runs, is that of its weakest link, and the speed of a squadron is that of its slowest ship. Similarly, the same rule holds good when applied to the other essential features just enumerated, and the few modern naval battles have proved this far too effectively to admit of any discussion of the subject. This similarity of character is generally referred to in naval language under the category of homogeneity. Now, the pre-dreadnoughts are so slow that they would delay the rest of the squadron, as lame ducks set the speed with which the farmyard pond is traversed. Speed is, in short, together with smashing power, the great consideration today, and will probably continue so to be. In the Atlantic fleet of the British Navy, in the Atlantic fleet of the British Navy, changes have recently been made which have brought about the entire homogeneity of the battleship. At the moment of writing, the eighth and latest British dreadnought to pass into the service of the battleship Vanguard and displaces just under 20,000 tons. 
This ship is also remarkable in that she carries the new improved 12-inch gun, which has a striking power 12% greater than the previous pattern of this gun, whilst in her two may be seen the last chapter of the story of armor development, which the reader has followed step by step in these pages. Instead of the 11-inch thickness possessed by the first dreadnought, this vanguard has it reduced to 9 and 3 quarter inches, which is thought to be sufficiently effective at modern battle ranges. But the secondary armament for dealing with harassing presence of torpedo craft is added, consisting of 20 4-inch guns. On the other hand, although the improved ships of the dreadnought type are in every way superior to their prototype, yet in actual cost they are becoming cheaper and cheaper to build, so that the Vanguard has been constructed with a saving of over 300,000 pounds. With the minor types of naval craft, such as depot ships, hospital, training, survey, repair, tugs, and etc., we have no space here to deal, though each, according to her office and ability, fulfills her part in the service by contributing to the aid of the larger and executive vessels, we have been able now to appreciate some of the uses to which the big ships of war will be put in the next naval contest between nations of first-class power, and in watching the development of the fighting ship, whose very creation is avowedly one of war and not of peace, we might be rashly accused of stepping out of romance into terrible reality. But without the ship of war, it would be impossible for the merchant vessel to go about her business with any degree of safety nor except with that security which a fleet in being affords. Would it have been thought worth while to invest and put a practical test to these many improvements of which the turbine is but one? Nothing gives the progress of shipbuilding so sudden and powerful a setback as a war. But once peace is declared, nothing accelerates the rate of construction so much. The competition between nation and nation, making each type better than the last, and each succeeding ship better than the best, is all in the interest of the ship and in prevention of war, which brings ruin. Today, more than at any time in the world's history, the ship has shown herself, whether as a man of war or as a simple cargo carrier, to be less and less dispensable. In the promotion of peace and the advancement of the world's progress, she is doing more than the most prophetic seer could ever have foretold. And whatever her subsequent history may be, or whatever modifications may be made in her appearance or means of propulsion, the latter half of the 19th and the first decade of the 20th centuries will remain memorable for the vast and unsuspected changes which so short a space of time brought about. End of chapter 14. Read by Paul Parkinson, Calgary, Alberta, June 2023.